Hey guys, so apologies for um, the stream not working. Uh, you know, technology is what technology is. So today we're going to talk about the um, voting methods in legislators. So legislatures, and by that I mean the ways in which legislators are chosen, not the ways that they vote in their chambers. Okay, so this is intended to sort of expand on some of the things we said on Friday. And, you know, on Friday we talked about how we have single member districts on sort of one end, end of the extreme, and we have proportional representation on the other end. And um, we are. Uh, we're going to um, go through a number of different systems that uh, provide that that sort of run the gamut between those two extremes. Okay, so the single member district is the Westminster system that we're familiar with in the U.S. That we're familiar with in the U.K. Right, you have a geographic district that elects one legislator um, selected using a first-past-the-post system. And first-past-the-post just means the most votes wins. Um, so that is the most uh, westminster -y system that is available. And then we have the uh, the American style system, which is a little more proportionate in that a lot of American elections require the uh, legislator to actually win a majority of votes cast. And if the legislator fails to win that majority, they go on to a runoff and they hit, they participate in an election with one opponent, and when you have two candidates, someone's guaranteed to receive a majority, right? So you're familiar with that. Then I want to talk to you about multi-member districts, okay? Multi-member districts are like single-member districts, but instead of electing one member, you have multiple seats. So some of you may come from states where the legislature... Um, has in the past or is now elected using multi-member districts. Um, for example, if there are any of you who are from New Jersey, right? In New Jersey, the uh, lower chamber of the legislature is elected using multi-member districts where uh, every county elects two members uh, to the, the chamber. And then every county elects one member to the upper chamber, and that's how New Jersey selects their legislature. Um, are there places elsewhere in the country that, I mean, elsewhere in the world that use multi-member districts? Probably. I, I don't know sort of off the top of my head, um, but there might, it seems, it seems reasonable, and certainly it seems like something that you see in... Um, subnational governments, um, in particular, like maybe municipal governments that elect uh, city councils sort of on an at-large basis where we're electing, you know, uh, five or 10 or 20 members of the city council, and they're all elected by the entire city. Uh, so, which of those do you think is more democratic and why, right? What constitutes being more democratic in this circumstance? Um, so after the multi-member districts, um, I want to talk about what is um, referred to as sometimes ranked choice voting or instant runoff voting, or alternative voting. And basically what this does is you get your list of candidates, 
you rank them, you know, here's my first choice, my second choice, my third choice, and then the votes are tabulated, the uh, candidate who receives the fewest number of votes is dropped, and those voters who listed that candidate as their top choice, their votes are reallocated to their second choice. And then we recalculate and we go through that process again, uh, and so on until someone has a majority of the votes cast. Um, so that's ranked choice voting. Um, the next voting system that I want to talk about is what's called uh, a single transferable vote. This one's a little complicated. The math gets wonky, but here's how it works. From the voter side, it looks like ranked choice voting. Okay, you get your ballot. It's got six or seven or ten names on it. You rank order them in, in your preference ordering. But instead of the loser, the person with the fewest votes, having their getting set aside and their votes reallocated, what happens is the uh, tabulators determine how many votes are required to win election. So in a single member district, it's 50%. In a multi-member district, it's a moving target depending on the number of seats. Um, but Usually it's somewhere around a third to half the votes, right? And then once a candidate reaches that threshold, once a candidate has secured election, then their surplus votes are reallocated to other candidates using a mathematical formula that is really not worth wasting our time with. OK, but that's the idea behind the single transferable vote is you get one vote. And if it happens that you vote for the winner, but your vote isn't necessary for them to win, your vote can go to someone else that you would prefer to help them move closer to winning a seat. Um, you. If this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you, that's fine. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but it's used out there in the world. Um, so the next, um, the next system that I want to talk about is what's called open list proportional representation. So you remember I talked about how on Friday in a true proportional representation system like the um, Israeli system, you don't cast a ballot for people at all. You cast a ballot for a party, and the party decides who goes into the legislature depending on how many seats they're allocated based on their, their vote share. Open list PR looks a little bit different. In open list PR, you cast a ballot for an individual candidate. But there is no guarantee, even if that candidate wins a lot of votes, that they will go into the legislature. Because while you vote for a candidate, your votes are aggregated by party. So if you have three candidates for party A and three candidates for party B, and some people vote for each of the A candidates and some people vote for each of the B candidates. And then you have to figure out who's actually going into the legislature among the four seats that you have. So two people are getting left out. And who they are depends on vote share, but also on party choice. Okay? The party gets to decide when they're allocated three seats, how many, they, who they want to provide those seats to, okay? And the last system 
sort of other than the proportional representation system, right? The last system that I want to talk about is a hybrid system. And this is a system that we see in Germany, we see in New Zealand. Um, yeah, those are sort of the big two that use this system. Um, some of the Scandinavian systems use something a little bit similar, but um, Germany is sort of the, the archetype of this. The way that the German legislature, the Bundesrat, is selected is you go in to vote and you actually cast two votes. You'll cast a vote in a single member district, and there are 508 of those. Okay. You also cast a vote for a party. Okay. And all of those votes are aggregated, both, both categories of votes. So you actually have two votes for the Bundesrat. And the votes in the single member districts determine 508 members of the Bundesrat. But those 508 members may not match the partisan balance of the total vote. So, for example, 20% of the seats may go to Social Democrats, but the Social Democrats may have won 30% of the ballots cast when we include the, the party ballots. The way that the Germans handle this is they actually increase the size of the legislature. These are called overhang seats. And they're intended to uh, assign additional seats to parties who are underrepresented in the district elections to make sure that the partisan balance of the Bundesrat matches the partisan balance of the electorate. If this makes absolutely zero sense, that's okay. It's complicated. And it's 100% okay for you to, to pause and ask questions and follow up on this because this one is complicated. Okay? So, and of course, the last voting system that we talk about is the proportional representation system. We talked about that on Friday. You go into the ballot box, you vote for a party. The party has a list of, of candidates it wins X number of seats and the top X names from their list go into the legislature, right? Simple, straightforward. What are the benefits of these different types of systems, right? Well, obviously, if you're voting for a candidate rather than a party, you actually have someone who is answerable to you directly. Right? There is no mediation of the popular will through the political party like there is in a more proportional system. But the more responsive the system is to the electorate at the individual officeholder level, Right. So the closer you get to that single to that Westminster system with the single member district and first past the post. The more likely you're going to see what we call strategic voting, and that's because of something called Duverger's Law. And if we were in a real classroom and we had 50 minutes a day and I had a whiteboard, I would go up to the whiteboard and I would derive Duverger's Law and sort of walk you through the logic of it. For now, let me just give tell you what it means. Duverger's Law says that um, when you have this Westminster-style system, single-member district, first-past-the-post, plurality voting, right? Politics in those systems converges on two parties. So those of you who are libertarians or greens or some other third party or just go, man, I hate both the Democrats and the Republicans. I have bad news for you. The electoral system means that we will 
always have the Democrats and the Republicans. They may have different names, they may form different ideological and policy coalitions, but there will always be two parties, one that represents sort of the leftish lobe of policy preferences and one that represents the rightish lobe of policy preferences. And the ish there is doing a lot of work on both sides and we're not going to have that conversation. Um, but that's that's the issue. If you don't like party politics in the United States, unfortunately, uh, you don't have a whole lot of options. There's always going to be two parties for you to choose from. Now, somebody may be, uh, may be smart enough to go, but wait a minute. The United Kingdom also has single-member districts and first-past-the-post uh, plurality voting, but they have lots of parties in the House of Commons. Why is that? And the answer is because of strategic voting. Because the truth of the matter is, is that there's really only one uh, British political party that is sort of nationally competitive, and that's the Conservative Party. Labour is overwhelmingly a party of London and um, waning industrial towns in the north of England. Um, the Lib Dems are you know, basically a, a suburban liberal party. Um, Scottish nationalism has supplanted Labour as the, the left policy coalition in Scotland. Plod Cymru is Welsh only. The, the Irish parties are Ireland only, right? So the Conservatives compete everywhere. And then there's usually one party that can compete with the conservatives as the left in any given district. And it really doesn't matter who it is. They're all forming coalitions together. But that's the answer in the UK is that in any given district, there's only two parties that are competitive. But because of strategic voting, more than two parties go into Parliament. Okay? So that's the issue with these single-member districts, is that voters stop expressing their sincere preferences, and they start trying to outsmart each other. Because strategic voting basically amounts to a voter going, well, I really like candidate A. But I don't think anybody else does, and I'd rather have candidate B than candidate C. So I'm going to vote for candidate B, who I think is more likely to win. So in proportional representation systems, or more proportional representation systems, right, sort of as we move closer to that proportional representation, that becomes less salient voters are able to express their sincere preferences and be and and allow these minor parties to come into the legislature okay and play a role in coalition forming which is what we will talk about starting on Wednesday uh so this is the conclusion of our conversation on chapter 9 on Wednesday, we will start on chapter 10, and we'll start by talking about how uh, legislative coalitions turn into governments in parliamentary systems. Okay, so uh, I'm going to post this to YouTube, and you guys should be able to see it about 15 minutes after I'm done. Thanks so much, and we'll be in touch. See you soon.